In this video, we're going to look at two tricky concepts from quantitative chemistry, atom economy and percentage yield. Now these are separate concepts, they've got different ways to work them out, but often people have learned about them at the same time and they just kind of end up getting mashed together in their brain. So let's see if we can straighten things out a bit. Atom economy is about conversion efficiency. So out of all the atoms that you started with in your reactants, how many of them are actually ending up in your product versus in waste products that you can't use? Think of this like you're cooking. Say you're going to make some dessert, you're going to make some meringue, and so you get a box of eggs and you break them and you take the egg whites and you mix them up with some sugar and you make meringues, right? But you've still got those egg yolks, you've still paid for the egg yolks and they're not actually going into the dessert, they're just being wasted. So that's reducing your overall atom economy. So this is a theoretical concept. I can look at the recipe and I can see that it's telling me I need to buy six eggs, but then I'm only going to use the six egg whites. I don't actually need to make that recipe. I can look at it and work out that the atom economy is not going to be 100%. Likewise, when it comes to real chemistry, I can look at the formula and I can work out the atom economy without anyone having to actually do the experiment. Why do I care? Well, it's all about saving resources. So the more of my reactants end up in my product, well, the better that is. The more money I'm going to make and the less need there's going to be for me to waste energy and other resources disposing of those waste chemicals. So in terms of the maths of this, what we're going to do is work out a percentage. So we're going to look at the mass of the useful product divided by the mass of all the products and times that by 100%. So first of all, you might be thinking, well, hold on, I'm sure I've seen it say somewhere relative formula mass. And you're right. The AQA GCSE spec does say that you want to take the relative formula mass. But that then gets really confusing because relative formula mass should only be for one mole. And if you're making more than one mole, then you need to take account of that. So let's just agree, we're going to take the mass of all the useful product that you make. You might also be thinking, well, hold on, why are you dividing by the mass of the products, not the mass of the reactants? And again, you're right, you'll often see it written down that we should be doing the useful product divided by the reactants. Here's the thing though, conservation of mass tells us that the mass of the reactants and the mass of the products is exactly the same. So if I've already worked out the mass of one product to get the total mass of products, I only need to work out the other product. If I'm going to work out the total mass of reactants, I have to go right back to the beginning and calculate everything. So it's going to take me longer, and at the end of the day, the answer will be exactly the same. Let's try this with some numbers to see how it's going to work. So there's quite a familiar equation here. Hopefully you recognise this as the equation for photosynthesis. I've got six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water combining together to make one molecule of glucose and six molecules of oxygen. So the first thing I need to do is to work out the mass of my useful product. And in this case, the useful product is obviously the glucose. Firstly, I need to work out how much glucose weighs. So I've got six atoms of carbon with a mass of 12, 12 atoms of hydrogen with a mass of one, and six atoms of oxygen with a mass of 16. If I add all those up together, then I know that glucose has got a mass of 180. Now, as for my oxygen, the relative formula mass of an oxygen molecule is 32, but I've got six of them. So what I'm actually doing is six times the mass of two times 16, which in total is going to be 196. Now, if I add together 180 and 196, I get a total mass of products of 376. And actually, if I added up six carbon dioxides and six waters, I would find out that that would still be 376. So it really doesn't matter that I've done it this way around. Now I'm going to put those numbers back into my equation. 180 divided by 376 times 100% to make it a percentage. And if I round that to two significant figures, that gives me an atom economy of 48%. Let's take another example. Here's the extraction of iron from iron oxide using carbon monoxide. So my useful product is the iron that I've extracted. And you can see there, there's a coefficient of two. So two times 56, the relative atomic mass of iron is 112. Now, as we said before, we could do 112 divided by the mass of everything on the left-hand side, but I've already worked out iron, so why don't I just work out carbon dioxide instead? The relative formula mass of carbon dioxide is going to be 1 times 12 for 1 carbon, plus 2 times 16 for 2 oxygen, which is 44, and 3 times 44 is 132. If I add together 112 and 132, I get a total mass on the right-hand side of 244. So now I can plug those numbers into my atom economy formula. 112 divided by 244 times 100% is 46%. Now here's one last example just to point something out to you. Here I'm just burning some carbon in some oxygen to make some carbon dioxide. 
and I can tell you what the atom economy of this reaction is without doing a single calculation. It's 100%. It has to be 100% because there's only one product. So all of my reactants are ending up in the product. So that's atom economy. Now we're going to have a look at percentage yield. So whereas atom economy was a theoretical concept, I could do it just from the chemical equation. Percentage yield is all about what's actually going on in real life. How much of the theoretical yield or the expected yield did I actually make? And it's never going to be 100%. There are five main reasons why that might be. The first one is that the reaction might not have finished. I might just not have let it go on for long enough. That's especially true if it's a reversible reaction, because reversible reactions are going to tend to stop somewhere in the middle and reach equilibrium. The third option is that there are side reactions going on that are making alternative products. So let's say I'm trying to extract some metal. Pretty every metal is going to react to a certain extent with oxygen in the air. So most of the time I'm going to extract slightly less metal than I expect because I'm going to be left with a little bit of oxide. My fourth option is that the reactants I started with weren't as pure as I thought they were. So maybe I think I've started with a kilogram of calcium carbonate, but actually only 90% of the substance I've got is calcium carbonate and the rest of it is just impurities. Well, they're not going to make the product that I'm looking for, and therefore my yield would be lower. The fifth reason percentage yield might not be as high as you'd expect, and to be honest, this is the big one, is because of losses during extraction. Imagine you're making fertiliser in a massive factory. You make all that ammonia, and then you have to pump it somewhere else through pipes. Well, little bits of ammonia are going to get stuck on those pipes the whole time. That's also true if you're doing a reaction in the lab yourself. Chances are that when you're scraping out a beaker or a crucible or some kind of reaction vessel, you're going to leave some of the product behind and so you're going to have percentage yield that's less than 100%. So if I go back to my example with meringues, percentage yield is more like saying, well, I meant to make 24, but then I kind of ran out of time to put the last batch in the oven, and also I dropped some on the floor, and I kind of ate one, so I actually only ended up with 14. So the formula to work out percentage yield is actually pretty similar to atom economy. We're doing actual yield divided by expected yield times by 100%. So just like with atom economy, it's always going to be a small number on top of a big number times 100%. Now, when it comes to exam questions, basically percentage yield questions are either incredibly easy or really quite tricky. There's not really any middle ground. I'll show you what I mean. The decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is expected to release 40 centimetres cubed of oxygen. Only 30 centimetres cubed is collected. What is the percentage yield? Now, apart from the fact that this is given as volumes rather than masses, there's nothing tricky here at all. I was expecting to make 40 centimetres cubed, I've actually made 30 centimetres cubed. So 30 divided by 40 times by 100% is 75%. My percentage yield is 75% of what I expected or hoped it would be. So questions like that are really straightforward and probably only worth a mark if they come up. On the other hand, you have ones like this. A sealed reaction vessel containing 560 grams of nitrogen and excess hydrogen is used to manufacture ammonia. 340 grams of ammonia is extracted. What is the percentage yield? So hopefully you know that excess just means too much. Basically what they're telling us is that there is enough hydrogen in there that all of that nitrogen will react. So first off, I need an equation. Each mole of nitrogen gas needs three moles of hydrogen gas to react with and will make two moles of ammonia. I've started off with 560 grams of nitrogen and however much hydrogen it takes to make that. And then I've somehow ended up making 340 grams of ammonia even though that's not quite as much as I expected. The first thing is I need to work out how much ammonia should I have made. And to do that, I need to know how many moles of nitrogen have I got. Using my periodic table square, the relative formula mass of a nitrogen molecule is two times 14, which is 28 grams per mole. I can rearrange the masses Mr. Mole formula to work out that the number of moles is mass divided by MR. That's 560 divided by 28, which is 20 moles. Now this is where I need to think about using my coefficients. You can see there isn't a coefficient in front of nitrogen. There's an imaginary one. And then in front of ammonia, there's a two. So if you think of this like a recipe, for every one nitrogen I started with, I'm going to make two ammonia. But I haven't started with one nitrogen. I've started with 20. So that means I'm going to make 40 ammonia when I get that. Now to work out how much that's going to weigh, I need the relative formula mass of ammonia too. So the MR of ammonia is going to be 1 times 14 for the mass of nitrogen, plus 3 times 1 for the mass of hydrogen, which comes out at 17 grams per mole. We've just said we'll have twice as much ammonia as we do nitrogen, so 2 times 20 times by 17, which is the MR, and that comes out as 680 grams. So now I can plug those numbers back in. 340 divided by 680 times 100% gives me a percentage yield of 50%. So to summarise, 
Atom economy is a theoretical concept and it requires an equation. It doesn't need any real life data. You're just going to look at the MRs of the different substances in the equation and see, well, how many of those atoms from the reactants actually ended up in the useful product. It tells you how efficiently your reactants could be converted and it will be reduced by the production of waste products, but it could be 100% if your reaction only makes one product. Percentage yield is a real world concept. You don't necessarily need an equation to work it out. You just need to know how much you should have made and how much you did make. It needs some real life data to do this. It tells you in reality how efficiently your reaction and to be honest, your entire manufacturing process proceeds in reality. It can be reduced by a number of things, including incomplete reactions, impure reactants, side reactions, and also issues with extraction. And it will never be 100%. Thank you for watching and if you found that useful don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos.